All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, I'm Ernie Humphrey, the Chief Operating Officer for TreasuryJobs.com. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us for our webinar today, Mastering Dashboards to Deliver Strategic Value from FP&A. I would like to thank our webinar partner, Percentage, a world leader in automated budgeting and planning software solutions for small to medium-sized organizations whose budget maestro family of software products provide thousands of financial leader, leaders with greater insight into their business performance and increased confidence in their decision making, and whose strong commitment to thought leadership helps us make this webinar possible today. Dashboards have become a powerful tool for FP&A professionals to share insight and gain respect. When designed correctly, they deliver a clear message on what's working and what's not, and the actions to take to fix issues. Technology now enable, enables us to create dashboards in minutes, allowing us to share information in ways we never could have before. You must leverage this technology. The big question has moved from how do we create dashboards to how do we harness this powerful tool to drive business behavior. Before I delve into the content, I'm going to offer a few quick words about treasuryjobs.com, cover a few housekeeping items, review our learning objectives for the webinar, and then I'm going to hand the floor over to our featured speaker, James Myers. So a few words about treasuryjobs.com. Treasuryjobs.com, we connect treasury talent with the right opportunities, and we endeavor to be a trusted career resource for treasury professionals. We serve some of the largest companies in the world, over 300 of the Fortune 1000. In terms of job listings, we only post treasury jobs. We are continuing to expand our value proposition. We offer treasury certification resources, complimentary webinars like the one today, and our treasury career, career blog, which offers actionable advice to fuel treasury career success. A few housekeeping items. The slides are currently available under the handouts area in your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll also be sending you links via email to the presentation and also the webinar recording over the next 24 hours. Important point for you on the call looking for CTP credit. For CTP credit, you have to answer all the polling questions and remain on the duration for the webinar. And you have to send me an email and let me know you want a CPE, CTP certificate. Any questions on CTP credit, please send me an email to ernie at treasuryjobs.com. Again, any CTP questions, ernie at treasuryjobs.com. We'd like to hear from you, so please ask questions at any time in the questions area of your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll do our best to get to your questions at the Q&A session at the tail end of our presentation. If we don't get to your questions during the webinar, we will follow up with you after the webinar to get your questions addressed. Finally, we appreciate your consideration in taking a short survey at the end of our webinar today as we always strive to improve the ROI we offer our event attendees for their valuable time. Let's take a quick look at our learning objectives as they offer the components of our value proposition to you in spending your valuable time with us today. The learning objectives today are to offer you an understanding of data and how you can harness it, to understand the data maturity model and how to leverage that to accelerate your data transformation, to offer you specific recommendations on improving the quality of your dashboards and give you some insights into the future of data analytics. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome our featured speaker to the webinar, James Myers. James is the founder and CEO of FPNA Strategy Consulting, a company focused on accelerating finance transformation. He is passionate about FPNA and has presented at various finance summer Summits. He's a qualified chartered accountant and he's held various finance and operation leaderships roles in multinationals such as Dell, Nokia, and has clients such as Hewlett Packard Enterprise. James, the floor is now yours. Please take it away. Thank you, James. Thanks, Ernie, and thanks for that introduction. Um, it's great to be working with you again. As you said, uh, dashboards are a um, are a very powerful tool. They really help a business, help them drive behaviors into the organization. But what's really happening um, out in the marketplace at the moment? What we're seeing is that the role of the CFO is changing. It's moving away from uh, the traditional compliance such as SOX, tax, uh, close procedures, uh, gap compliance, and even some some of the more the optimizations such as lowering costs and it's moving to uh, areas such as customer facing where we're looking at uh, growth, um, strategic, understanding the market, uh, suggesting new opportunities and predicting the market change and being disruptive, uh, focusing on what's next not what has been. And this was really um, summed up in um, the following uh, blog by, oops, Something's happened here. Just go back a few. 
uh, by Gary Smith. Uh, Gary is a LinkedIn uh, top uh, one, uh, top ten business leader in the UK, and um, he pretty much uh, stated that uh, the uh, the role as moving away from these traditional roles to a more strategic advisor and active business partner. And then he went on to say that. The, the real pr problem is that they have a lack of time. Given all these new responsibilities and um, new roles, uh, they don't have enough time to invest in activities that uh, really break the, uh, break the mold, you know, do, do things differently. So what we're seeing is that a lot of the time uh, businesses are, you know, CFOs are really struggling with the weight of it and FP&A is, uh, uh, is the team that really needs to uh, step up and help fill that gap and I see that dashboards are, are one of the components of that. So I've been following these trends for some time now and I still think that there's a big gap between uh, what FPA should be providing and what they're actually providing. Um, there's very there's many reasons for this, but uh, it, one of the but the re, uh, one of the reasons I started FP&A Strategy Consulting about four years ago was to help companies accelerate their transformation and look um, you know providing resource expertise and coaching. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to find opportunities to um, improve the the time that CFOs have and really kind of help drive um, automation and systems. We kind of see that FP&A um, is really has three main drivers. Uh, the first driver, uh, sorry. So here are some of the uh, CFO um, uh, statistics. Uh, so CFOs are overstretched. Uh, over 33% of, uh, of senior finance professionals say their organisation relies on gut feel rather than hard data. Now this is quite a, a shocking um, statistic. This was taken from a survey done in uh, 2016, especially as we're moving to towards this information age where everybody has ac uh, access to data. But you know the problem with data is that it is all over the place and it's very difficult to get hold of. Um, some of the other statistics coming out of the survey, 51% uh, percent don't spend enough time with their business partners, 33% um, of CFOs are struggling to make the best use of technology available to them. We are seeing, you know, as this information age is uh, upon us, that there's a lot of new technologies that are out there and a lot of opportunities to take advantage of them. But often there's just too much technology and, you know, it's really about solving real business problems. Um, some of the other statistics coming out of this is 66% admit they, ha they have too little time to spend on innovation and process improvement. And uh, the last one is that 66% believe that they have an inability to uh, master the variety and volume of uh, new business data, um, which is becoming a serious threat. So, you know, all of these, um, all of these challenges uh, are challenges that are felt by the CFO, and um, these are things that FP&A can really step up and take a an active role in um, focusing on and streamlining and uh, being a business partner as well. So at FP&A, we uh, believe that the value. Um, to the CFO and the rest of the organization is really made up of three key drivers. Uh, we see the first one as an active partnership and when we think of active partnership it's really about being working with the organization, uh, working with the business partners, etc. Understanding their needs, being empathetic and trying to understand what their challenges are as well as um, working with them um, and um, providing solutions. Uh, the next one is proactive resolution. Now often when we look at uh, FP&A um, and we look at the amount of data that often we have in a financial organization, um, we, we, we often you know, provide the organization with reams and reams of data. Now when we think of proactive resolution, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to look at it, what is the real business problem that we're trying to solve. Working as an active partner you know, you get an understanding of that, those, those business problems. And then proactive resolution is more about focusing on not uh, necessarily providing all the data that you think might be important, but really trying to spend your time in understanding what the real problem is, driving a solution and, um, you know, using data to solve that, uh, solve that problem. The third one is uh, one that probably, you know, in FP&A we should be more actively involved in, which is insight-driven strategy. 
Now, we have a, um, the idea here is that um, our strategy within an organization is often driven by a strategy organization and it's, it's often decoupled from the rest of the organization. In FP&A, we spend a lot of time gaining insight. We, we, we work with our business partners. We, uh, we try and uh, understand where the problems are and we, we uh, look at data to, to resolve those problems. This gives us a huge amount of insight into the organization and often uh, opportunities to grow the, grow the business and see where the, where the opportunities are. Where I'm seeing um, there's a bit of a breakdown in, in the FP&A function is that uh, this insight is often uh, not directly uh, fed into the into the strategy. So when we think of uh, you know FP&A as a whole, we're thinking of really being able to drive uh, insight um, into the strategy. And once it's in the strategy, then working uh, then it becomes part of the the DNA of the organization. So we see we see where if, you know we can really master these three areas, you know then we're really um, setting ourselves up to change the game to win. This can be summarized in the in the next slide, um, where we can see it's called the uh, FP&A value cycle. Uh, FP&A uh, are the go-between between between three main areas. We talked a bit about the strategy, we talk about the business, and we talk about data. So strategy is, you know, when we think about strategy, often you know it's uh, we think about the the big uh, vision of an organization. You know, often uh, when we look at strategy, we have to be uh, a bit more granular about what is the strategy of the of our company. Uh, the irony is often that uh, it's easier to describe the strategy of your partners than the strategy of your own company. But strategy is broken down into three main areas. It's broken down into um, uh, the the challenges that the organisation is going to overcome, is trying to overcome. Uh, it's then the second part of it is uh, the guardrails that the, the organization sets itself to overcome those challenges. And the third one is the actions that it's going to take uh, to overcome the challenges within the confines of the guardrails. And it's really the third piece that is the most important part for FP&A because that's the piece where um, you know the actions coming out of uh, an organization strategy, and it may be the organization strategy, it might be your business group strategy. These are kind of all filtered down, but it's really for FP&A getting a detailed understanding of what are those actions that we want to take, um, um, and be able to kind of drive that strategy into the organization because we're a key player in driving the strategy. And when we get onto dashboards, we'll actually talk about how we, how we look at strategy to drive the, uh, the insights that we generate in our dashboards. The, th the second one is uh, business. Now, when we think of business, we think about um, an organization's uh, interface with the outside world, and it's typically your sales team, it could be your marketing team, and um, you know, the, so any interface with, uh, which is ex uh, executing on your business model. Um, and then the last, the, the third piece is kind of the data. Now, when we think of data, often in FP&A we think of financial data, but there's a lot of other data out there. I mean, there's the operational data, which is also key to finance. And then, you know, we can go down into a lot more detail into the marketing data, but data is, can also be external to the company. We can think of market data and things like that. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a... Um, a cycle between these three elements, and the cycle goes in, a, in typically in one direction. Um, we start off with strategy, and we have the strategic support. And strategic support, we're really thinking about how do we take that strategy and build it into a business plan. Um, typically, this ends up being our business forecast or our budgets that then get led into our business. So we we are um, act as business partners. Um, we. This is where our active partnership comes into play. So taking the, the business strategy and converting that into a um, into a plan that then becomes uh, part of the business. Um, the business then gets their gets their their targets and their budgets and things like that, and they have a lot of business questions to ask. You know, who's going to be the who's going to be the biggest customer if we're going into new markets because that's part of our strategy. It'll be, um, you know, who are in those markets and who's buying in those markets. What opportunity do we have and things like that. And this is where you know this active partnership really comes into play because it's really understanding 
what are the problems that the business are facing um, and really being able to get a deeper insight into um, how we can solve those problems. The next piece is between the business and uh, the data. Now this is often where your dashboards come in and it's, uh, it's uh, providing the insight, uh, generating the insight. Now once you have a problem, uh, the best way of solving it is to go and find the data that solves that problem. So if you've got a business question that you need answering, the best way is to go to the data. Often, if you have a whole bunch of data and you go and try and solve business problems, it doesn't necessarily work because you don't know whether you're solving a problem or not. So, you know, it's really about getting very focused on what the problems that you want to be solving in. And this is where dashboards, uh, you know, become, come into play. Um, so you, you create all this wonderful insight and you get this proactive resolution. What do we do with that insight? The final step is this value creation step where we're really taking that insight and we're driving that back into the strategy that, so that it becomes part of the core of uh, and the DNA of the organization and then is delivered to the, the business through, a, um, through your active uh, partnership again. So I'm going to have and back over to Ernie um, just for a polling question. Great. Um, thank you very much, uh, James. And uh, I, lo I love your last slide, the FP&A um, value cycle. So those of you on the call, I, I would print that slide out. So that's one of my favorite slides. So very compelling. So I'm going go ahead and launched our first polling question, um, asking you to share with us some insights on the most challenging issues that you face. Uh, again, those of you who are interested in CTP credits for today's webinar, you need to answer all of our polling questions. Of course, we appreciate everyone's consideration in answering our questions. And polling question time is a really good time for us to take your questions in the questions area of your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, we have a great opportunity to tap James's great expertise here, so I would love for all of you to take advantage of this opportunity. So I'm going to go ahead and leave the polling question up um, for another five seconds or so. Then we're going to go ahead and share those results. Then we're going to go ahead and get James' uh, initial take, and then we're going to get back to James' content and focus on um, why dashboard. So I'm going to go ahead, give you the three-second warning here. All right, NCA tournament time beat. There's the buzzer. Go ahead and close that. Uh, go ahead and share those results. And uh, James, what are your initial thoughts here? What you expected? Any 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 uh, concentration in categories you wouldn't have expected? Yeah, I mean uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, taxonomy and definitions. We see I don't know uh, you know smaller companies. I don't think this is a, 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 an issue because it's kind of managed within a smaller team. But that's that's one that we see in in a lot of the larger companies. So it'd be interesting to see the survey by by the size of the company because I'd expect that one to be higher. Um, you know, the, the typical ones are, you know, there's a lot of complexity in finance data. There was an interesting uh, survey that was done that said, uh, you know, we have uh, of uh, Fortune 500 companies that are over 250 million, a third of them have two to six um, financial systems, a third have between six and ten, and a third have over ten systems. Wow. So even just in the financial data, you know, it, complexity is is one of the biggest problems. Um, you know, no single source of the truth, I think, is the one that, if we can solve that one as an FP&A organization, I think this is the one, and it's great to see that one kind of out in the front there. Um, that's the one that really helps an organization. That's the one I spend a lot of time focusing on. You know, we need to get everybody to just agree to one, one, one truth. Um, so, yeah, no, this is a, I think it's, a, it's pretty spread across all of them, so it's an interesting result. All right. Thank you, sir. So let's go back and hand the floor back over to you and let's get back to why dashboards. So dashboards, why are they so important? Um, they make complex things understandable. If you think about an, um, a, a salesperson, if you give them a, uh, a massive Excel spreadsheet that's uh, 5,000 5, lines long, you know, it, typically they don't necessarily uh, can understand it. The nice thing about dashboards is that they're easy to interpret. interpret. Um, they make excellent communication tools for uh, upper management so that um, we're able to communicate very quickly. You know, the best dashboards are the ones that are uh, updated. They have a high frequency of updates and we can actually see trends happening real time. 
Um, they help the business align and drive behavior in various directions. And what this means is that often, you know, if there's a, a, a change in business, we talk about, you know, change management and things like that. You know, um, I was working on one project and there was this big debate about, um, you know, we need to change the organization to um, adopt, you know, a certain new way of thinking about the way that they look at the business. Um, instead of actually giving them a, an incentive, um, what we ended up doing is we created a dashboard around it and we really started from senior management down where we actually started driving this business change in the dashboard and people understood it because they could see how the dashboard was changing and how their, their, what their, their actions were impacting the dashboard. Um, they can be interpreted at a glance so that um, you can give a huge amount of volume of data um, to executives in a very short period of time. You know, mobile is becoming uh, uh, pretty common now. Um, you know, when when designing your dashboards, you should always think about uh, what these dashboards look on mobile, because. People want to consume them quickly. You know, if you have an executive, he can switch his phone on in the morning. He can have a look at a dashboard and see what's happening. Take him, you know, th two minutes, uh, and then he can turn it off and get get all the insight instead of sending him a deck that he'll probably never read. Um, it makes it um, data accessible. Um, you know, it puts it into something that's more user friendly and. Uh, um, and it also can be accessed on demand, so you can get information when you need it. Um, you know, typically um, the old way of doing it, I remember probably 10, 15 years ago, we'd send out a daily email uh, to kind of give people kind of the insights for the day. Um, it would, uh, you know, that's all being replaced. If they need it, um, then that's great. If they don't, then that's fine as well. And the nice thing about dashboards, if you can get that single source of truth and you can get a, a compelling dashboard, um, that is on that is it, the data ends up being self-correcting because people will complain about the accuracy of the data and then you need to fix it in your single source of the truth um, and it really drives that accuracy. The challenge we have though is uh, there it goes the reality uh, you know as we start to look at organizations and uh, we see organizations, um, sorry, lost control of the uh, slides a little. Um, the reality is that um, often there's too many metrics. So, you know, technology has grown um, and there's some wonderful uh, BI tools out in the market and they, they're pretty easy to use. Um, they're becoming more um, consumable by even the uh, finance organization. So finance teams no longer have to rely on IT professionals or uh, BI professionals to create dashboards. Um, they're able to do it um, themselves and what's happening is there's just an abundance now of, of different dashboards. So, uh, you know, there's there's often too many dashboards, um, you know, and it's difficult to decide what's important and what's not. In one example, I think I had um, 150 metrics uh, for an organization. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at that as a, as a consumer of that data, how do you decide which one I should focus on and which ones I shouldn't? So it becomes a bit of a challenge when there's too much. When we're looking at um, dashboards as well, uh, stuff, sometimes there's too many messages um, and it's difficult to really interpret. What you want to do is, you know, whenever I create a dashboard and, um, you know, it often goes through a lot of evolution, but I always test it with a whole bunch of people just to kind of um, uh, see kind of how, how people are interpret it, interpreting it very quickly. Um, the worst thing that you can get when you get this, uh, you know, th there are too many messages is you often um, get conflicting messages. Now the idea of a dashboard is to drive behavior and if you have an, uh, an organization that um, you know is very focused on their metrics that's great but if you build metrics that you know one drives the organization in one direction and another one conflicts with that then there's going to be a, a, a huge challenge. Um, there's also a concept called vanity metrics, and vanity metrics comes out of Eric Ries's uh, Lean Startup when, you know, focusing on uh, the, the metrics that are really important to your business that really help to drive your understanding. Uh, Vanity metrics typically are the ones that you don't focus on. These are the ones that make the business look nice. Now, uh, probably if we did a survey now, only we'd probably find that most people actually measure revenue, and revenue is one of those vanity metrics, which um, you know is a um, a metric that basically 
it's important to understand, but it's very difficult to figure out who is um, who's driving the driving the metric or how you drive that metric. Um, so we'll get on to talking a bit about vanity metrics. What we really want to be driving is actionable metrics. Um, you know, I think this the my the next point is is changing a bit. You know, poor user experience. Um, you know, we are seeing that BI tools are improving significantly. But again, you know, it's all about um, you know user experience and making sure that um, your user is able to get the most value out of it. And my favorite um, reality is low adoption. So you know, being able to get you know what that's one of the key measures on the success of any dashboard is being able to measure um, uh, the adoption of um, the um, uh, the adoption um, to make sure that people are using the dashboard. So getting on to data, uh, data is overwhelming us. The rate of data, uh, the rate at which uh, we're generating data is rapidly outpacing the ability to analyze it. Um, I think this 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 quote is kind of uh, is becoming a, a very apparent in the world of FP&A because what we're seeing is not only is data complex and we saw that um, you know from the survey earlier that that was one of the one of the challenges that people were facing, but it's also growing. Um, they say data is gro are growing exponentially, and it's grow it's doubling every uh, every twenty uh, sorry yeah twenty four months. So and I think that number is even starting to come down as well. So you know we just have this mass amount of data that you know is uh, starting to become uh, a real problem. But the nice thing about data is it only comes in three forms. Um, so it kind of makes it a lot easier. We have uh, what's called the known knowns. Uh, these are the things that we know we know. Typically, this is what you know our sales for all the last period, um, and um, it, so it's you know our financial statements or our balance sheet or things like that. Something that's happened in the past and we and something that we know we know. There's the known unknowns. These are the questions we have. These are the typical analysts political uh, questions like who's going to uh, be the most profitable customer or even who's going to do the most revenue or if we're growing in a new uh, you know, business or new area or industry it's kind of who are the who are the customers with the, with the most potential or uh, opportunity so the, this is kind of where the insight comes and then the third one is called the unknown unknowns and these we call the golden nuggets where you know it's it's those outliers that you weren't even looking for and um, trying to get an understanding of um, your uh, known uh, known unknowns you suddenly come across something that you weren't even expecting um, and these are the ones that you know we can really get the most value out of now typically what you want to do is you want to be focusing uh, as an FP&A organization your energy on the known unknowns. Uh, this is where um, you know this is where we're solving all these questions that people are asking that we know about. Um, but it's very important to keep your eye out for the unknown unknowns. We don't want to be spending too much time on the known knowns because these are things that we already know. And this is where dashboards come into play a lot. It's really you know being able to build out uh, dashboards that really answer a lot of those questions of the known knowns. Uh, for the organization, um, as well as starting to uh, express some of the known unknowns as well. Um, so that's kind of where dashboards fit. And the value you can see at the bottom is uh, increases as you go from left to right. So data is alive. You know, it's... Uh, come on. Um, you know we have uh, we have scale of data, so we have the volume of data. So data is constantly uh, increasing. We have variety of data now. Um, you know when we think about variety, uh, you know typically we think about um, you know our ERP system or C uh, CRM systems, but data is all around us. We have data in Excel spreadsheets that are held throughout the organization. Uh, people take their their data out of the out of the source system. They make some manipulations to it. They put it in a nice uh, PowerPoint presentation, and then they report it to the executives after making those changes. So, you know that's that that insight is held somewhere on somebody's uh, on somebody's PC. Um, we also have velocity of data, and uh, velocity, you know, means that data gets gets old and it expires, and it doesn't, you know, the older it gets, the less value it is. Um, and uh, veracity, it's veracity. I had to look up. It's uh, 
uh, its accuracy. So it's really trying to get you know an un uh, uncertainty of the data, but how how accurate is that data? And these are some of the kind of the the big data challenges we we often struggle with. Um, so what we've what we've come uh, what we've tried to develop is some uh, model uh, which is um, you know really helps us to get a better understanding of how do we tackle data within an organization. And uh, so this is the, the data maturity model. Uh, we have the foundation, uh, foundational data acquisition and data building. And when we think about data acquisition and building, it's really about aggregating. And this is kind of the first step on the evolution of um, the data maturity. It's about creating this idea of a single source for all financial and operating data brought into a single uh, platform and being able and becoming a trusted source. The next one is master uh, master data implement uh, implemented, and here we think about accuracy. Um, the challenge that we often have in this in this part is trying to get alignment throughout the organisation. Now it was very interesting on the survey that we just had that um, a low percentage said that um, the taxonomy and definitions were were that you know it weren't that important to them. I think you know this is this is the foundation, and often what we what we're seeing in large organisations is that a single set of data on multiple different uh, systems, financial systems, often results in um, uh, you know different taxonomy, different uh, hierarchies, and it takes quite a lot of effort for everybody to agree on what the same uh, taxonomy is. The other part of this piece is also let's move away from these offline manipulations, the ones that are happening in the Excels um, throughout the organization, and let's try and bring these online. And this is uh, this is a big undertaking to get um, your organization to kind of move away from let's manipulate it offline to do it online. Now, you know, when we think about the data maturity model, it's not something that you know you kind of start from uh, from the first step and then you kind of run through each step in its entirety. The way that I would suggest using this model is to kind of take a, a small section of your data, run it through the model, and then continually add um, data sets onto that. The next step, we talk about the BI tools and dashboards. We're looking at access. We, talk, we spoke a bit about access earlier, but really being able to use, uh, create a user-friendly BI tools um, and really allowing secure, uh, secured access to giving people the data that they're entitled to and able to, you know, um, allowed to use. The next one is adoption that drives behavior. And we'll talk about making data actionable, and we'll get into how do we make data actionable. But you know, it's it's not you know if we just think about um, uh, just the different steps of data, we don't want to just be doing the known knowns. Um, we don't want to just be giving people the data that they know they know. We want to be giving data and challenging people and take getting them to take actions um, on some of the known unknowns to really help them drive their business forward. And then the last one is the changing the game, and it's really about making people accountable for their data. Um, but it's also, you know, taking that data and really helping the drive the organisation forward and driving those behaviours. Um, so this is kind of um, this is a, a model that we're looking at and implementing into clients at the moment um, by actually centralising that data, making it available, and then driving action and accountability through that data. So tips and tricks for dashboards. So once we've got all our data sorted out, I think you know one of the biggest challenges that we have is really being able to um, make da dashboards more effective. And I think uh, simplifying uh, is one of the key things that we need to do. Design thinking, we'll get into a bit about that. Taking actions, we've started talking about a little bit about actions, and then telling a story. I think you know as we're seeing the evolution of uh, technology within uh, dashboarding and creating uh, dashboards, I think one of the areas that is becoming more apparent is that um, the organisation around this needs to change. What we're looking at is actually driving um, a dedicated organisation that not only looks at uh, master data management and uh, the consolidation of data, but also the BI. Um, 
and all, and then kind of the insights as well as kind of the data science as we start to get into a bit more of the maturity of the models. But you know, for it, and within that falls the dashboard organization. You know, having one organization within your in your company that's focused on, you know, not necessarily uh, just BI, but focused on, um, you know, what do these dashboards mean? Building out the principles of the dashboards throughout the organization, I think, is also a, a key um, within your organization. But let's get on to. Uh, I think we've got a polling question now, so I'll hand back to. Uh, any. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, James. I'll go ahead and, and launch our second polling question, uh, kind of helping frame the content a little bit. So asking you to share with us the most common reasons you've seen dashboards fail um, at your company. Uh, again, we'd be happy to take your questions in the questions area of our GoToWebinar control panel. And another reminder, those of you interested in CTP credits for today's webinar, you'll have to answer all of our polling questions. So again, um, I'll go ahead and leave the question up for another 10 seconds or so. Then we'll go ahead and take a quick look at the survey uh, results, and then we'll get back um, to kind of uh, the, the fine point and the actionable items, which are the great tips and tricks for dashboards that James is going to share with us. So I'm going to go ahead and close the polling question here in a couple seconds. Okay, and close the polling question and go ahead and share those uh, results. And James, what's your initial take here? Yeah, I think um, you know, the one coming out at the top there is uh, too, min too much information, too many messages. I think this is a um, very, uh, you know, this is a very common issue among many, many companies. I think, uh, you know, a lot, there's been a lot of initiatives um, in recent times where people have gone, we need to do, we need a dashboard. We need a dashboard to, you know, so everybody's gone off and built a whole bunch of dashboards and, um, you know, it's, it's, it can get very confusing because uh, the, me the messages can get lost, um, you know, too many people are in involved and that's why I keep on coming back to this idea. It's still, a, you know, a relatively new idea of having an organization and it's actually, you know, it, the one that we're looking at doing is a, an organization within the FPNA organization. So it's a subset of FPNA that actually helps to manage dashboards throughout the organization. Um, so we don't end up with this uh, confusing message. Um, unable to drill down into data. That's another key one. You know, um, there's uh, we we call that the, the auditability um, of data, and you know, being able to drill back down to the the source or um, you know, if somebody's made adjustments, who made those adjustments and things like that is a, a, an extremely important part of uh, the data management. And being able to do that um, helps to uh, make sure that your accuracy of data is high. Um, I think that, um, you know, as you see, uh, you know, more and more dashboards coming online, you know, you don't want to have the conversation about, uh, you know, is the data accurate? You want to be able to have the conversation about what it means. And that's one of the biggest challenges we're also seeing. Um, you know, if you can drill down into that information, get back to the source, or even get like a, a deeper understanding of it, then, uh, then that's great. Um, Thanks, Ernie. So uh, the first step really is uh, about simplifying. The ability, uh, the ability to simplify means eliminating the unnecessary, so that the necessary may speak. And I think this is a this is a this is a great uh, quote, uh, but it really applies um, a lot to dashboards. Often, what you'll see in dashboards is people try and get everything into the dashboard. Um, you know, often what you have to do is you really have to step back and say. What am I trying to do? What problem am I trying to solve? Um, and um, really, kind of uh, look at the dashboard in that light, so that you're able to you're able to um, take that take that information and really help to change the organization. So to simplify, I think you know uh, the first the, a couple of tips that I have here is uh, the first one is to uh, focus on. Uh, key metrics. Um, typically, an organization shouldn't ha should have about three to four key metrics. Now, it doesn't mean that you need to stop doing all the metrics that you have, but it's these are the ones that really are sitting at the top and helping to drive the organization. Now, the other thing is that um, these key metrics don't need to be static. So, for example, if you are driving in a certain direction and you found that you've achieved your, your, your goal, uh, you may decide that you want to move this metric down into a, a lower category, but really focusing on kind of how do you, how do you choose those four uh, 
uh, key metrics, and we'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, reducing the noise, what we often see is that there's a lot of um, uh, noise in uh, in a metric. What you want to try and do is reduce the amount of what they call the ink ratio, um, where you the, the less ink that you use, the the more you'll be able to gain from that uh, that information, and aligning to the strategy. So this is uh, um, a bit of work that, or a blog from Dark Horse Analytics. I think it's the work of Edward uh, Tuft. Um, Basically, we talk about the ink ratio, and you can see on the left-hand side here is kind of a, um, a metric um, which uh, kind of uh, highlights uh, different uh, different foods, and then you have on the right there you have kind of the the low ink uh, ratio. So on the left, you've got a lot of ink, you've got a background, you've got lines, you've got uh, uh, things on the side, you've got headings, and all sorts of things. Um, whereas on the right, it really tries to kind of reduce down um, the ink so that you're not you know um, you're not focused on all of these colors and it's not overwhelming. Um, uh, but also the other thing is that you know when you're looking at something like uh, a metric like this, you're able to call out what's important. Now in this case, for whatever reason, bacon was the most important thing to call out, um, highlighted in a different color. So you can see how, and you know, feel free to kind of read more about um, about that under that. Uh, on, Web link at the bottom there, but it really is about you know getting away from putting too much uh, too much ink into your metrics and trying to kind of make them very clean and easy to read. The second one we talk, spoke about is strategy, and if uh, we talked about the three areas of strategy, uh, the diagnosis, the guiding policies, and then the co coherent actions. Now, um, if you want to read the book Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, uh, you just need to read chapter five. Um, it's a, it's a great insight into kind of um, some of the some of the, the good strategies. The book actually kind of sets out this concept of the, the three areas and then goes into where um, examples of what are um, some good strategies and some bad strategies. But you know you know from an FPNA organization, our responsibility doesn't necessarily include strategy. We should be a partner in strategy helping with the insights and things like this. But where I see the most value is if you've done a good strategy, it's really those coherent actions that are designed to carry out the guiding principles that are, are the things that start to kind of fall out as, you know, when you think about the three, four metrics that we need to drive. What are the three, four things that we uh, we think um, this organization is um, you know what is their strategy? Where are they driving towards? And this helps us to kind of def you know, simplify our metrics a bit. So we have a uh, a quick example here. So this um, so don't worry about too much about the strategy itself. It's uh, we're not going to debate whether it's a good or a bad one. But you know the business strategy is to become the leader by units in market share in the main product lines in an organic market, which will position um, us for long-term growth while continuing strong relationships with our partners. So effectively, what they wanted to do is they wanted to ungrow, get uh, underlying growth, uh, but you not really upset their current partners. So they were in uh, retail as well as online. They didn't want to upset uh, their retail by being very aggressive in their online. So that was kind of their overall strategy. One of the areas, so you can see then they had brand, they had pricing. We're going to just focus on customer experience. The key objective there was uh, maintain a high level of customer awareness and react quickly to change. Um, we then, you know, decided to uh, put in some success factors. Now, these are these are all slightly hypothetical. Um, we we change. I, 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 the the work I did on this, I, I've changed. But you know, market share growth of one percent per quarter, and then uh, the key drivers uh, focus retail reps on targeted uh, stores. So once you've kind of got your strategy up at the top there, and you've broken it down into your your you know your key pick. Uh, uh, key actions, which are kind of focusing on your brand, focusing on pricing, focusing on customer customer experience. Um, you know, within the confines of uh, maintaining a strong relationship with your business partners, you can see how now the actions start to come out of 
you know, we want to maintain uh, the action of the key driver, which is focus on the retail reps to, uh, to target uh, on targeted stores to maximize the opportunity. You can see how this is then distilled down into a, a metric. So this is kind of going to the next slide, um, the metric that we we decided to build for them. This is a uh, each of the stores that they had, um, and it basically the two different product lines they had. I've changed the data, so we have fruit and stemmed vegetables, and um, the um, the metrics themselves are it's just the uh, the the points of uh, the average. The average. Uh, market share is 12.3% and for example the first one there is doing uh, two points above so it's doing like 14% uh, market share. The ones that are below the average are doing like uh, uh, Vineyard are doing 6% uh, below the market share so they're doing about 6%. The idea of this is this, this report was generated on a weekly basis from market data um, and what you're able to do is you're able to drive uh, say retail um, uh, uh, sales force into different areas. So, for example, you may want to look at a, um, uh, you know, Gateway, for example, is doing exceptionally well in fruit, um, and you might want to see why they're doing well, or you might want to push retail reps to a vineyard that's doing exceptionally well in, um, in. Uh, in fruit but not doing so well in vegetables and see what opportunities you have there. You can run a program for a couple of weeks and actually watch these um, graphs change over time. So it was an effective way and it was also very actionable because what they had is they had actions to drive those behaviors uh, and, to, and that impacted the graphs. The other thing when we think about dashboards is design thinking. So, so design thinking has been around for a long time in software. I think it came in the 80s, but it's really getting a deeper understanding of um, you know of your customer, um, defining what their their problems are, um, coming up with ideas, uh, building a prototype, and then testing that prototype. Uh, when we think about empathizing, you know this is one of the key areas that really helps us drive that within the FP&A organization, getting a deeper understanding of your customer, um, uh, whoever that is, typically your, your sales team or your marketing team or whoever you're supporting is, 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 uh, is pretty key in this. And then being able to define what their, their problems are um, and getting it, you know, understanding from the user's point of view as opposed to from an, a finance point of view. So FP&A, I think, is no longer just kind of sitting behind a monitor in a, in a cubicle somewhere. It's really getting in front of people and understanding, you know, what their challenges are. So, you know, and the nice thing about dashboards is because the technology is so easy, we can do a very quick prototypes. So, we, you know, we'll build a, a dashboard in a, a day or two and uh, you know the challenge is that it may not be uh, updated automatically which you know will happen over time but at least we've got like a prototype and people are using it and we can test adoption and we updating it manually but we can you know over time we can replace that with an automated process and then the idea is to really test you know get it in front of the users get it in front of people that don't always look at the stuff you know, get their feedback. Is it is it giving them the you know if they're looking at it, is it giving them the information that they need? And that's also key. And the nice thing about building a prototype is you can change it very quickly. Often when I do prototypes, I often even build them in Excel. And uh, you can use uh, SharePoint now and just put your Excel on there, and it acts as like a web interface because uh, I think with the new Excel uh, works pretty well. But this is an example of a persona. I'm not going to go into it in detail. Um, but it's really about sitting down with your key stakeholders and getting a detailed understanding of, of, of them, their challenges, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're doing. There's actually a whole process around uh, understanding the persona. Uh, this was some of the work, just uh, extracts from some of the work that we, uh, we did. Um, you know, kind of Fred, the C, C, uh, chief commercial officer. These are some of the some of the things that he was thinking and this helped us design a dashboard. He originally had a deck of about 150 pages of market data. We, we put that into a single dashboard and he could flip between all the areas so he could he could drill into the areas that he wanted to do to look at. And that's not a picture of him by the way, it's just stock art. <laughs> So the idea of a persona as well is to um, you, you can you know it 
it can be a group of people. It doesn't have to typically be one person. Um, in this case, it was one person. The next one is about action. Action is the foundational key to all success. Um, it's really about, when we think about action, it's that idea of moving away from the vanity metrics, you know, the things that Eric Maurice uh, is talking about, into something that is more about um, uh, things that are actionable. So really converting it into um, something that's more meaningful. And we spoke a bit about revenue being a vanity metric. Now, when we think about revenue, it's impacted by so many, so many uh, different things that, for example, sales teams, marketing teams, operations teams, all of those people are impacting revenue you in some uh, way or another. Um, what we really need to do is to make things more actionable, is to really start to peel back the drivers underlying some of those revenue. If your revenue is based on sales and you've got salesforce.com data, you know, doing analytics on that would understand the drivers that would then result in the revenue and getting an understanding of what your conversion rate is, what your coverage and those sort of metrics, you know, the um, um, a lot of a lot of the work in the SaaS companies have been doing, you know, really looking at more of the actionable metrics um, to really kind of understand uh, how their businesses run. Um, when you look at uh, metrics, you can typically, you know, the, the deeper you go, so often what you find is that the metric that is a driver metric doesn't necessarily give you the total answer. So revenue is the um, is the kind of the, the, the top level. We went down into stores at level one and then field force in level two and we could, what we were doing is really understanding the impact from that graph that we saw earlier of what that field force were doing um, to influence the, the retail stores and we could measure that very dramatically, I mean, very accurately on a week to week basis um, which then drove newer metrics because we'd learn from each of those metrics whereas if we just look at uh, revenue we tend not to learn too much. So we tend to have less control over things like revenue and at the lower, at the lower thing we have more control so the field force we can direct them where to go. So it's really going from that revenue which is the vanity to actionable metrics. And this is uh, another example of an actionable metric where I, I quite like using these quadrants. Uh, this one we had uh, promotional dollars and we had year-on-year uh, -year growth. So effectively, if you had high promotional dollars, you would expect high growth. So you can see that uh, black bubble in the top left-hand corner, um, whereas low, low promotional dollars, probably low uh, growth, which you can see in the, the, the bottom right with the... Uh, the orange bubble, um, but uh, you know, sort of, there's there were companies that uh, had low promotional dollars but high growth, and then we had these companies. Um, so this is kind of a just a quadrant uh, where we had high promotional dollars but low growth, and then the 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 nice thing about doing a quadrant is that then you can assign sort of actions to each one of those quadrants if something happens in each one of those. So this kind of gives you an idea of, uh, you know, invest in strategic products. So it's a decision that we're investing, making sure that we actually in this top left uh, quadrant, if we do invest, not in the bottom uh, left one. Um, the, you know, gaining an understanding of why we're growing if you uh, if you got this organic growth. Um, I think a lot of those those companies that were growing in that one, we found out that they were actually just because they had high discounted pricing. Um, understand uh, when we are under investing, you know, we, we it's a conscious de decision to invest more less than the competition, but we, we understand that we're going to lose market share. And then if we're investing and we're losing money, um, then that's a problem. So it's each one of these we need to take a, uh, a look at and make sure that we are investing in the right places um, and how we're investing. And, you know, this chart can definitely help with kind of the actions uh, we wanted to take. And the last area is kind of telling a story. You know, the challenge that you have with dashboards is that we have to be able to uh, tell a story. Um, the way that I like typically like to tell a story is I, I typically go uh, from my vanity metrics, which are at the top, which aren't very detailed, to my actionable. And this is just uh, just kind of a layout more than don't look at the, the numbers or anything because I haven't spent any much time on them. But, you know, you really start up at the top here and we're using things like cards and gauges uh, where we're kind of looking at, you know, how's our revenue doing, how's our margin doing and things like that. So that's kind of like, you know, the stake in the ground up at the top. Those are the vanity metrics. Those are the, what everybody else likes to, to look at. I then typically go into a funnel chart 
which in a final chart are these kind of block charts and things like this. Um, and what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to point the user in a certain direction. So in this case, I think it's a percentage budget. So we can see in uh, the, the left-hand uh, funnel chart, Europe is at 101.4% of, um, of their budget. Now, if I wanted to, if I was looking at this, I would say, okay, I'm 98% uh, I'm of budget. Um, I know that Europe is green because it's 101. I want to click on Americas, and the idea of, uh, you know, the funnel chart is you click on the Americas, and all the data around it changes. Um, so I can go immediately and see, okay, this is my problem. I can drill into it. So you're not, so your user is kind of, um, channeled in different directions depending on what he needs um, so that he can get to the answer quicker um, without having to look through a huge amount of information. So, you know, in this example, maybe they just want to ignore Europe altogether because um, it's uh, it's doing pretty well. Um, you know, maybe they think they could do it better than they could jump into it. Um, <coughs> when we think of the, uh, the next section down, this has got my charts in it. Um, you can use bar charts, you can use, um, I, I quite like those quadrants uh, with the bubbles in them, uh, I find those quite effective. But this is where you really want to put your more uh, detailed, uh, actionable metrics, the ones that are really driver-based. Now, when you think of drivers, you always think that you need to get that metric down to a single person. If you can identify the person that's responsible for that metric, that's a that's an effective driver metric, so that you're able to then say, okay, to that person, you know, this is your metric. You need to make sure that it looks like X, Y, or Z, and they go and drive that. And then typically, what I do at the bottom is I uh, I include a whole bunch of tables. I, you know, I found that uh, if you take the tables away, people will start to get a bit. Um, worried because they can't look at the detail. I tend to put it at the bottom because I don't necessarily think it's that relevant, but I like to have like that whole structure where we're going from the high level down to the detail, and you're able to select and drill down in each of those 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 graphs as you start to go down the uh, down the dashboard. Uh, so when we think about the future of analytics, I think you know uh, it comes down to what the CFO is focused on. Um, you know, it's really about driving growth. Um, you know, it's about looking at where the opportunities are, predicting change, um, and focusing on what's next. And you know, the, the analytics that we use today, the, the big data and all of that, I think is great and it's going to evolve, um, you know, significantly. But if if you think about, you need data to to uh, get to the end point, we're going to be challenged in FP&A, um, you know, figuring out what's next, um, and that's kind of like where the big challenges are going to be because there is no historical data, and that's where we have this concept that also coming out of Eric Reese's uh, work is, you know, about uh, innovation accounting, where we we're looking at new ideas and building a hypothesis around it and then testing it, putting data in there, testing out a solution and things like that. So often what we find as well, and this is some of the work um, done by uh, Nassim Taleb, is um, what we it's easier to measure something going forward. So if we have the ice cube, as you can see in the background, it's easier to measure how that ice cube is uh, melting over time if we at the start than if we were to have a melted ice cube and try and figure out what the, the ice cube is. So I think there's a lot of innovation um, happening in uh, in data analytics, but I uh, I think I've run out of time, so I'm going to stop there. And I think uh, I just uh, wanted to say thank you. Um, I've got one slide here. Uh, just if you're interested, connect uh, on my LinkedIn. Uh, more than happy to accept anybody uh, with a finance title. And uh, the a um, couple of a uh, couple of uh, blogs on there. And uh, so more than happy to carry on the conversation. Great. Um, thank you very thank you very much, James, for that fantastic, compelling content. Love the specific examples that you had shown. Um, in order to be mindful of our time, we just have time for a few questions. Again, if we don't get to your questions, we'll have James or I reach out to you afterwards. Um, a few quick hitters, um, James. Um, so metrics are part of it. Um, how do people go about measuring the impact of the metrics? What's the value of the metrics? How do they make that link there? Yeah, so I, I mean, uh, this is uh, an area that I'm exploring a lot. Um, uh, I was working with a company recently, and they they actually assign uh, value from their sales team 
um, you know, their sales team commit to say that this metric drove X amount of incremental revenue, and that then gets assigned to the uh, the team, the finance team um, associated with that. So, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of different ways of going about it, but um, you know, one of the key things that I always uh, like to ensure it. <coughs> sorry is that we have the adoption. Adoption is key for the success of any metric. If nobody's using your dashboard, then there's no value to it. And the way that you measure that value is um, making sure that people are using it. So whenever you say, up a dashboard, and you know you are you've, you're bringing people on board, and you're training them. Make sure that you know you're they're aware, and you you know you continually measure their uh, who's using it, why they're using it, and also just you know have those conversations. Why aren't you using it? Or uh, even uh, to the people that are using it, what value are you getting from those dashboards? So I think you know. There's a, there's a, this is a you know an area that we we're still exploring and looking at lots of uh, different from different angles, but I think you know making sure that uh, you have people using your dashboard is probably the, the, a good starting point. Great. Um, one final question, just to put a real fine point on your content. Can you share with us the top three common mistakes that you see people making in regards to the dashboard, so we can get these folks to remo remove some of the inherent barriers they might face? Yeah, I think, um, again, uh, the common mistake is let's just give people every metric known unto man. Um, that, that one I see a lot, um, and it's really about what let's just choose the ones that are really going to make an impact. Let's really get focused on those three or four. Um, you know, the... Um, what I've seen historically is the user experience of the tool, making, you know, test the user experience again and again and again, make it easy for the, the person to get to their metrics, make it easy for them to get to their information. Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to be the bottleneck in between um, Insight and your and your customers. You want to be able to make it a self-serve solution. And uh, let me think about a third one. I think it's just, you know, it's just the um, making, you know, it's the, it's too many and being a bit overwhelmed by all, all the dashboards. My recommendation there is to have like a center of excellence or a uh, kind of a hub of people that are able to manage dashboards and be able to build out a standard uh, format, standard usability, and also kind of make sure that there's value being gained from those. And if you don't have the adoption, then turn the dashboard off. Fantastic. So thank you very much, James. Uh, again, I need to thank you for your great content and your insights. Sincerely appreciate your thought leadership. Always a pleasure. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Sanage. Again, we appreciate and share their commitment to thought leadership, which is also evident in the great content and resources they offer, which you can experience by visiting the Sentage website. Again, please note that we're going to launch a survey right after I close the webinar. We sincerely appreciate your feedback, as we always want to get better. And also, you have the opportunity to connect with James, uh, so so have a connection request with James, um, fantastic resource. And also, finally, a big thank you to the audience. Thank you very much for your valuable time, and make the rest of your day great, everyone. A pleasure.